and uh, we're uh, working on getting the live stream for uh, YouTube going here in just a moment. So again, welcome online, and we'll try to get people going in these two type media. And then we will consider our Sunday school uh, lesson on First Peter chapter two. And it's, uh, what is it? Oh, I didn't put it up there. Okay, nine and 10 anyway. Yep, nine and 10. First Peter 2, 9 and 10? Yes. First Peter 2, 9 and 10. All right. We have some more friends coming in, and that's good. And, okay, we have people joining us online as well. And we're not getting the YouTube going in a good way yet for some reason. I'm going to have to restart this deal. So uh, thanks for your patience on this as we get things going this morning. And welcome. Welcome, friends. All right, let's try this again on YouTube, that is. I guess we're not going to get that camera going, but you'll still be able to hear it if you're on YouTube, uh, so we're just going to do it that way. So, unfortunately, there's something not going quite right about the YouTube, but you'll have the audio. I believe you'll have the audio, but I have no picture for you. I don't know why. Sometimes this happens, and things are just... Uh, so. Uh, if you have ability, you want to go over toward Facebook today and uh, chime in. Okay, uh, welcome again. Let's have a word of prayer, and we will be ready to start. Loving Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the beauty we have of looking into your word and understanding through the power of the Holy Spirit. We thank you for your uh, uh, fresh understanding and insights that you give to us uh, through those that study, through those that write about your word, but especially those that follow the leading of your Holy Spirit. And we thank you for the great truth that all believers have that ability to receive the Holy Spirit. Now, help us in the Sunday School. Bless those are, who are viewing and perhaps listening, and uh, be with them and guide them to your truth, too. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so 1 Peter chapter 2, and verses 9 through 10. Where's my clicker? Lost the clicker. Lost the clicker. Yeah, it's on this side. All right. 1 Peter chapter 2, 9 and 10. And we'll jump right up here so I can see it a little better too. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Well, praise the Lord for this wonderful word too. Uh, years ago, a few years ago, uh, there was a movie called The Princess Diaries. Maybe you remember that. Uh, it was kind of uh, getting some nods and some not. Well, there was an unpopular teenager who lived in San Francisco, and she unexpectedly found out that what she thought about her whole family was not true. And her mom had never told her the truth about her father. Her father had never told her the truth about all of this. And she thought she was just simply another teenager struggling through life. But then grandmother comes to visit. And grandmother has parades through town in a stretch limo 
with flags waving and accompanied by motorcycle policemen and sirens are screaming and grandmother just happens to be the queen of a country in some place in Europe, uh, Genovia, I think is the name of it. Yeah, okay. And grandmother uh, comes to town and finds granddaughter uh, and announces to her that she is going to be queen <laughs> of this country. And so from there, the, the, the whole plot unfolds. This gangly teenager chokes with surprise and unbelief and then anger that no one's told her and then overwhelm and goes through all this kind of rethinking about who she really is. And it all seems unreal and too good to be true, but it eventually works out that um, it is true and she embraces her role as, as being queen. And it's all made all the more fun by, uh, what's the actress that does that? Julie Andrews is the queen. Yeah, Julie Andrews is the queen. Yeah, and she comes in very stately and it always helps to have a British accent to do those kind of things. And then, uh, I was trying to think of the teenager at the time, but yeah, you, you would know her, a very famous one. Anyway. Uh, well, for a few moments this morning, maybe we can recapture a little bit of what the teenager in the movie felt because when we learn the truth of who we are as believers in Christ, this is really striking because the Bible says that you are royalty. <laughs> you are royalty. And we think, oh, I live in the country of America. We're not. But, and we might think of ourselves uh, maybe uh, too skinny, too fat, too imperfect to be a, a royal we might think of ourselves as a ball of worry or frazzled or or or, or not worth anything or barely holding together you know all of life's problems and and uh, under our belt we just can't possibly keep it all together but God knows that you are royalty you're a prince of a person you're a princess of a person in his kingdom. And all of this comes to bear on the Fireside series because we have to know who we are in order to communicate to our world uh, what it really means to have hope. Because the world, you know, they don't, they don't have this understanding of who we really are as Christians. Uh, uh, we're made in the image of God. All people are. But they don't understand that. They need to know who they are. And we are to live as born-again believers, not only in the image of God, but as God's chosen people, as royal priesthood, as a holy nation, a people belonging to God himself. And remember, God's perfect. So all of that is uh, coming to bear on our mission to give hope to a world. Because... We have a royal mission now. It's not just a, a, a common everyday thing. You're to live as God's chosen people right now. And with this hope that we have, uh, declaring the praises of God or him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. So here comes the Lord into our life like grandma in the limo. And suddenly we're elevated when we're born again. Anne Hathaway, yes, yeah, 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 yeah. right, right, uh, oh, yeah, okay, all right, we're keeping up, yeah, Anne Hathaway, and she has this way of doing, it. shut up, I can't, uh, talking to Grandma about this, uh, you know, it's like, well, shut up, what is this, this is all about, I did. oh, that's the way teenagers talk these days, and this, uh, anyway, and, course the movie's now what 20 years old or so but it illustrates the point really rapidly and wonderful okay so there are four phrases up here that we're going to key in on today and want you to walk away or or leave the computer uh understanding your new status as royalty because this really transforms everything first you're a chosen people second you're a royal priesthood and then third, God says, you're a holy nation. I don't see much holiness in our nation right now, but 
You are a holy name. We'll get back to that one. Uh, fourth, you're a people belonging to God. Now, all of this uh, about royalty, all this talk makes no sense unless you're born again. It just doesn't make sense. But John 1.12 says that as many as received him, to them he gave the power or the authority to become the sons of God or children of God, even to those who believe on his name. So Jesus is the reason why you are royalty. Okay, you don't get there to be royalty without Jesus. <laughs> yeah. So we can't take the shortcut and just say, oh, well, I'm a great person because I'm right. Uh, Jesus is the reason why you're a king's child, just to put it in terms. Uh, so if you know Jesus as your savior, then the royal status applies to you right now. If, if you don't have your sins forgiven by God, then... Uh, then you're kind of forfeiting the royal inheritance and uh, you don't, you have to get right with God before you get royalty. Anyway, okay, so uh, you know how that goes. Uh, well, helps to have the right page in the right order. <laughs> We're not ready for that yet. All right. So the verse just before 1 Peter 2, uh, 2 describes Jesus... Well, it's actually in chapter 2, verse 4. Uh, and if you have your Bibles open, you can notice there uh, how Jesus is described in verse 4. Hey, come on in. Glad to see you. Good morning. Anybody have it there? Chapter 2, verse 4. How is Jesus described? Okay, chosen of God, that's, yes, that's it, but even a bigger metaphor there is the living stone, the living stone, so we're going to work with both of those, thank you, uh, he is a living stone rejected by men, but, there it is, chosen by God, and so, I mean, we follow in Christ footsteps so sometimes we have to go through that rejection by men but we need to know that we are chosen by God as royal princes and <laughs> princesses in this all this so Jesus is the precious cornerstone he is the stone the builders rejected has become the capstone so we have to get all of that right in order to understand who we are and so we've been going through this series talking about that. And remember that Peter is, uh, you know, he's writing about rocks. And that should have some kind of importance for us as we think about it because of Peter's name being Rock. And he's writing about the chief corner, Rock, who is Christ. So even though uh, we see no indication here that Peter is thinking of himself as the first pope, exalted above all things, or equal with god or anything like that no we see him as pointing toward jesus christ right okay so we're just clear on that and uh, we have nothing solid to build on unless we have jesus christ solid and so uh, we go on from that and that jesus will hold us in the storms of life and the tough times and things like that uh, you, while i was working on the farm you know how this is you're working on the farm. You, you, you got us every year. It seemed like we had to go around and make sure the fence posts are going to stay up for the the cattle when they're turned loose, because the barbed wire gets kind of loose and all like that. Sometimes you have to get the pliers and, and you know pull them back, and you just get another horseshoe nail and nail it right into the post, and, and you pull everything tight. But in order to do that, you have to have a strong corner post. When you pull out that wire from that corner post, you have to know it's going to stay there. And so it's the same way with us. We have to have something very solid. And Jesus Christ is that solid corner post for us to pull on. And, to, and then our posts throughout life are going to stand up or different seasons 
Otherwise, it's going to sag and we'll fall over. We need Christ Jesus. And Peter was writing to people that were in crisis. And I see our world kind of almost in as much crisis as they were having, too, where persecution is mounting, different things are going on. Uh, we got to get, we're going to get stretched, we're going to get stressed in everyday life. But when we pull on the cornerstone, or in this case, the corner post, Jesus Christ, we're going to be able to stand up under the stress and persecution in our world. And we're going to be firm, even though we get stretched. Okay, so all of that's important because it's kind of understanding why we need all of this. So we look into our scripture, and, and God says who we are, and we learn that we're nothing without Christ on the the foundation or the corner or the cornerstone or all of that. Now let's look at the positive way uh, that we are royalty. First, you're a chosen people. So God has called you. He has elected you uh, to respond. These are biblical words. We don't have to be afraid of them. Uh, we may not understand all of how that goes, but the biblical words are that he calls us first. And uh, in fact, in Ephesians, it says, Ephesians 1, 4 through 6, before the creation of the world, to be holy and blameless in his sight, and he, in fact, predestined us to be adopted as his sons through Jesus Christ in accordance with pleasure and will. So, again, just want to reiterate, because we looked at that passage a number of times before, before God created the world, he was thinking about you. <laughs> I mean, that's just astounding, but it helps us to understand these phrases and what's going on here. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Amen. All right. Christ died for us. And we have to respond. We have responsibility, but God makes the first move in all of this. Second phrase. Oh, I'm way behind. Oh, way behind. <laughs> I forgot. I'm sorry. <laughs> we, uh, now we come to the priesthood. Now, this is an important thing uh, because of the phrase, the priesthood of all believers. Uh, sometimes you might hear about that. Priesthood of all believers. Well, what does that mean? Advent Christian Declaration of Principles says, We believe the Church of Christ is an institution of divine origin which includes all true Christians of whatever name. Okay, we can go along with that. But that local church organizations should be independent of outside control or congregational in government and subject to no dictation of priest, bishop, or pope. Although true fellowship and unity of action should exist between all organizations. So briefly, the uh, congregational uh, form of government in our church is uh, we're independent. You know, no one's got to tell us how to believe. Well, all right? We're going to get our authority from the Bible. And how can we do that? Well, through First Peter chapter 1, uh, chapter 2, and verse 9. Uh, you are a royal priesthood. This is the day of Pentecost. And so God's Holy Spirit, we remember, was poured out on all believers. They had the ability to understand what happened through death, resurrection of Christ, and all that thing. But also to understand the Old Testament scriptures. And we have the ability as royal priests, all of us, to understand God's word. So other people, uh, you know, have valuable things to say, but we in our congregation can be assured that uh, we too are royal and a priesthood. And everyone who speaks the word of God speaks with authority of that word. And so, personalities, positions, power players, in all of that world, uh, their only authority really derives from the Bible. And if they don't go to Bible authority, 
then they don't really have authority over us in the same way. So a pastor, you know, the, a pastor is going to study, it's going to pastor is going to dedicate time to praying and understanding God's word and working with the Holy Spirit to understand that. But ultimately the pastor stands up or whoever stands up in the pulpit and preaches, the authority comes from God's word and not from a position, stuff like that. Or uh, we might say uh, in all, since all believers are a priesthood, a royal priesthood of God, we don't divide up the church of God and say, oh, well, this person's really spiritual and this person's not so spiritual. So this person can be a pastor and this person can be a janitor. And, and you know, we don't do that. All persons, every people are priests. I didn't say it grammatically right, but everybody is a priest. It's, it's really a transformation here. Everybody is a minister, at least as I understand the Bible. So the musicians of the church are ministers. The custodian of the church is a minister. The pastor is a minister of the word, but we all have ministries and they all have value. They all are part of that royal priesthood. And this has implications too because we're all active ministers. We don't just uh, come and spectate, so to speak. We don't just come and sit around on church. That's at church. That's not what we do. We minister. We minister to one another, yes, in the body, but we also are ministers out in the world when we leave here too. And those that uh, minister in other cultures are missionaries, but we're all ministers. And everyone has a job to do, so no one's a bench warmer. <laughs> no one's on the second team. They've got to wait for someone to get hurt before they go. No, we're all on first team. We're all out on the field. We're all playing in the orchestra or... The band, you know, right? We all have a job to do. We're all priests. We're all on the first team. We're all there. Everyone's a minister. And we want to avoid this hierarchy. Well, oh, he's a priest or he's a minister. So his prayer is more valuable than my prayer. No, 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 don't do that. You're a royal priesthood. Your prayer is valuable. Oh, the pastor's prayer is so much more valuable. No. No, it's not. <laughs> We're all in this together. We're all. All right, so I think you're getting the point here. But there's a lot of implications in terms of church government, in terms of why we do things the way we do things, and how, you know, we go out from here, and we don't just say, oh, well, pastor, go out and get them. Bring them in. No. Everybody is a witness. All right. Second, uh, third thing, you're a holy nation. Years and years and years, we read all these books, or we could read all these books by pop psychologists and booksellers making a lot of money around our country, and telling our country we have a problem with self-esteem. All you need to do then, you're just putting yourself down all you need to do is think more positively about yourselves and our country will be just much better. You'll be a much better person. Well, to some degree, there's some truth in that. But, again, there's no shortcut to this. Uh, the, the evidence doesn't add up because when people do these opinion polls and studies about things, uh, people were asked to rate their abilities in certain things. And, for instance, on their job. And in one study, most Americans about their job said, about the, their job, most Americans said they were better than average when it came to their job. That's tricky. That's tricky. <laughs> most Americans said they were better than everybody else, <laughs> or most people. There's not a problem with self-esteem when it comes to that. Uh, 
more than 50% rated themselves in the top 10% when it came. So there's a little bit of disparity here going on. A small minority rated themselves as less than average. Okay. Uh, I don't think our problem is low self-esteem but it's rather understanding who we really are uh, we're, uh, and who we're listening to and who we're believing. If we are set apart for God to do his will, if we're born again, we will be tuned in to what God says about us in this passage, and we will have proper self-esteem, but it's because we learn the truth about who we are as God's children not because we're building ourselves up and thinking uh, I'm above average, I gotta be above average in all that I do. Uh, uh, I'm better than most pastors out there. Well, no, I'm not. <laughs> I'm just uh, right in the bunch of all of them. You know, we don't need to go this way because we don't have to compare ourselves. We just say, oh, well, I'm, I'm part of this holy nation. Nation here is not talking about America. Nation is talking about who we are as God's people. God knows you through and through. He made you. You belong to him. He says you're holy. I, I don't feel very holy at times, you know. But what is holy? Again, we're set apart for God's use. It's not necessarily perfect. We're set apart for his use. Sorry, I didn't really make a lot of great graphics this morning on all of this. You just got basics. Fourth thing, you are a people belonging to God. These phrases, this phrase was first used when it was talking about ancient Israel. And God brought the ancient Israelites out of Egypt. In Exodus 19, God said, Now if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all nations you will be my treasured possession. Although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. So what was applied to Israel is now applied by Apostle Peter to the New Testament church, to us. That's really remarkable. And these phrases, including a people belonging to God, include both Jews and Gentiles who believe. Gentiles as well. We're saved by faith. We are a blessed people by faith. And so um, Peter says, once you were not a people, but now you are a people. What's that? Well, that's a, uh, he's uh, in verse 10, he's quoting from the book of Hosea. Remember Hosea had, <laughs> yeah, I read through that book recently. It's like, wow, Hosea, what a life. God told him to go out and marry a person that would, eventually be, if not already was, unfaithful to him. Marry an unfaithful woman. One that would in fact be a prostitute. It was an object lesson, but these prophets, you know, they, they had to go through some difficult things. And the children that this woman bore to Hosea were not really, some of them, were not his children. And so he talks about this in Hosea, and that's brought over by Peter to say, once you were not a people, because Hosea actually names the child, not my people. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's kind of the reality of it, is this is just a straight shooting kind of a book, Hosea. But Peter applies it to us. Once you were not a people, but now you are people of God. You belong to him. So once we were out but now we're in we have to know this the faith in Christ makes all the difference and you learn who you are uh, and the Apostle Peter wants us and then we can have a proper self-esteem about our task and we can be prepared to go out and do it uh, do you like uh, tracing your family history and genealogy I do uh, and it kind of helps, you know, when things are so unsettled about that, you know, and people are moving from place to place and we don't have the same, you know, you go back to like a homestead area and you kind of dig through and you find stuff and 
or you know you go to cemeteries where your loved ones have been uh, placed and yeah it's kind of neat uh, before it completely fell down <laughs> I stepped through the house where my dad grew up um, when he was really young now it's, it's it's flat and it's gone and found a, an old notebook of his like from sixth grade or something like that and uh, it was all you know ruined because of weather because the roof was long gone all of it. Uh, uh, and that's kind of it, it kind of grounds us when we know kind of our roots and our family history and what my dad went through or what others went through when we read in the Bible that's the same kind of effect as we it kind of grounds us and we find out what God thinks about us once you are not a people but now you are a people belonging to him and we find our roots not only in uh, the New Testament but in the Old Testament people of God because it's just one family of God and we can think about the corner post we can think about the family of God we can think about uh, the cornerstone all of that uh, but we come back to this idea I see I'm out of time and we just go quickly through it. Here is Christ. And then who are we? We're a chosen people. We're a royal priesthood. We're a holy nation. A people belonging to God. And I just have to, you know, we have to learn who we are so that you know you can go out there and fulfill what God has told us to do. And that's to be a witness. You will naturally be a witness because of all these royal things that you are. You're royalty. You're born again. You will naturally be a witness. And then we have the opportunity every once in a while, or maybe often, to tell others, come on into the family of God. Why don't you become part of the family of God by believing in Jesus? As royalty, you're, you have royal work to do, but it's a joy, and, it, and it's a good thing for us to do, and, uh, and help others uh, to learn their job, too, as uh, uh, equipped by the Holy Spirit uh, with these four wonderful phrases, chosen people, royal priesthood, holy nation, a people belonging to God. Why? that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Any comments on the uh, Facebook site there? Okay. Yeah. All right. Any comments uh, from the congregation? You just talking about the Lord of priesthood. It's, it's not just what we do, but when you think about the priesthood in the Old Testament, now we have direct access to God. We don't have to go through Aaron or you know, that family. So, uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. That is the. That gives us the courage then to to say. Uh, uh, well, since we're all priests, that that we have that direct access. Yeah. Uh, uh, all right, I see what happened now <laughs> to my YouTube stream. It went to the wrong camera. I don't know why it doesn't do that, but it went to the wrong camera. So you got the audio today. Uh, the other camera uh, it wasn't turned on to do that. All right, so that's why you have the blue camera today, because I have a blue piece of tape over the wrong camera. <laughs> Yeah, I know. That's the reason. That's the reason your screen is blue if you're on YouTube. <laughs> Strange why it went to that camera. I'll have to reset it. Okay, let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you again for your love for us and for telling us who we are. Build us up not so that we're inflated about an opinion of ourselves, but so that we can carry out the task that you give to us and bless each one with uh, an elevation 
in Christ Jesus, our Lord and Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, sorry about that on YouTube. We'll see you later, literally. All right, and we're ending on Facebook. Thanks for joining us uh, live.